So recall that parental consent is required in all of the in all situations really with the exception of the four that you see here emergency situations anything pertaining to sex drugs contraception etc trauma which kind of goes in with emergency situations and then when the minor in question is legally emancipated and that's what the focus of this video is going to be it's going to be what constitutes legal emancipation and how can that be attacked from the USMLE or Comlex question writer to try to confuse you and throw you off your game. So we're talking about legally emancipated minors today. Let's dive right in. So emancipation really should make you think of, it should, has four criteria. And when you see these four criteria, you should think, okay, this is a minor that's emancipated and therefore can make their own medical decisions. So the four criteria that you should keep in mind to try to figure out if somebody is an emancipated minor is what you see on this slide. So the first one says earner. So this means that they're the primary bread earner, right? They have a job and with that job, they support themselves. So they don't rely on parents or legal guardians for financial support. They have their own financial support. Maybe this is somebody who, for example, dropped out of high school, works full time and makes enough money to support themselves. So maybe they have an apartment, um, they have a lot of money coming in and they're not relying on parental support. Criteria number two, uh, it's possible that if they're in the military, they can be emancipated. So anyone who has active military service is technically an emancipated minor if they're uh, still in that less than 18 years old age range. Criteria number three, living alone. So it says alone, and this means that this, the person is living independently. So if it's a minor, but they, can, they have their own apartment or they have their own house, which kind of ties into number one, that they're an earner, and that they can support themselves, as long as they're living alone, they're technically an emancipated minor. So it's, again, the, the theme here is that these minors are not reliant on their parents. They can support themselves, they live alone, and or they're in the military. And then the last one here that you see says nuptials. So this is that the patient is married. So they've exchanged their nuptials and they are married now. So how do you remember this? Well, emancipated. E for earner, M for military, A for alone or lives independently or lives alone, and N for nuptials, meaning that they're married. So emancipated, E-M-A-N. These are the really high yield things that you should keep in mind for determining if a minor is emancipated. Again, the high yield point here is that the minor is not reliant on their parents. So it's, it's less important to know the criteria and more important to just understand that if the minor does not rely on parents, for like housing, finances, etc., they're emancipated. So that's really what the law looks at. Now with that in mind, and now that you have an understanding of emancipation, I wanna introduce three really challenging ethics practice questions that deal with emancipated minors. So these questions are gonna be similar and I'm gonna change them for each of the three questions. So the first one says a 16 year old girl is brought to the ED by her mother for concern of depression. The mom steps out of the room and the patient reveals that a pregnancy test done at home was positive. She begins to cry and says that she feels overwhelmed. She pleads with you not to tell her mother. Which of the following is the most appropriate action? A. Tell the patient's mother. B. Do not tell the patient's mother. Or C. It depends on state law. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about it, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you the answer. So the correct answer here is B. You do not tell the patient's mother. Pregnancy falls into one of those categories in which informed consent from the legal guardian is not required in an adolescent. That is to say someone who's less than 18 years of age. So in this case, the patient's pregnant and she's asking you not to tell her mother. And because she's made that request, you as the physician are legally obligated to not tell the mother that the patient is pregnant. Now, that's the absolute answer, and on your exam, you could see a variation of this where they ask you what is the most appropriate initial action. So typically, the most appropriate initial action will first be understanding why the patient does not want you to tell her mother. After that, the correct answer would be encouraging the patient to speak to it about her mother, but understanding that legally, you cannot tell the mother because the patient made that request. So understand how this works, especially understand that informed consent is not required in this case because the patient has asked you about something regarding sexual intercourse, contraception, and pregnancy, which falls into that category that's excluded from needing informed consent. Now this doesn't technically deal with emancipation per se, 
but it is a question that comes up with regards to informed consent and being able to get the consent of a patient who is still not emancipated, but also not an adult. So it's very high yield to understand this. Let's move on and try another practice question. A 16-year-old girl is brought to the ED by her mother for concern of depression. The mom steps out of the room and the patient reveals that a pregnancy test done at home was positive. She begins to cry and says that she wants an abortion. She pleads with you not to tell her mother. Which of the following is the most appropriate action? A. Tell the patient's mother. B. Do not tell the patient's mother. C. It depends on state law. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about this, but if you're ready, let me give you the answer. The answer to this practice question is C. It depends on state law. The important thing to understand is that in some states in the U.S., parental consent is actually required in order for a minor to receive an abortion. In some states, the minor can absolutely get the abortion without telling the parent, and parental consent would not be required. However, because this differs state to state, the answer here is that it depends on state law. So if this patient lived in a state where parental consent was required, then legally, in order to perform the abortion and make the referral to the proper specialty or clinic to have this done, you as the physician would have to tell the patient's mother to get informed consent. But if the patient, for example, lived in one of the states where parental consent is not required, then the answer would have been A, or excuse me, the answer would have been B, do not tell the patient's mother. So because there's this discrepancy, it depends on state law. Now let me pause for a second and say that on your exam, because this is a very controversial topic in terms of some states say that you need parental consent and some states say that you don't, chances are you won't be asked this question. But I think it's really important for you to understand this as your future role as a physician, and it's also good to know for boards just in case they really want to get tricky. Let's move on and do practice question number three now. A 16-year-old girl is brought to the ED by her mother for concern of depression. She had a positive pregnancy test done at home yesterday, and her mother is fully aware. So in this case, mom knows that the daughter is pregnant. Patient begins to cry and says that she wants to keep the baby. Her mother interjects and says that she wants her daughter to get an abortion. Which of the following is correct? A. The patient will be required to have an abortion. B. The patient will not be required to have an abortion. Or C. It depends on state law. So in this example, we've got mom and we've got a minor. And the minor, who's the patient in this question, is pregnant and wants to keep the baby, but her legal guardian, mom, wants her to have an abortion. The question is, who gets you know, the final say here, or does it depend on state law? So pause the video if you'd like to think about it, but if you're ready, here we go. The answer to this one is B, the patient will not be required to have an abortion. In this case, it really doesn't even matter what state law says about the parental consent to have an abortion. What's high yield to take away from this practice question is that you always defer to the choice of the pregnant minor. It doesn't matter if the parent or legal guardian disagrees with what the minor wants. If the minor wants to keep the baby, the minor gets to keep the baby. The only time that the parent or legal guardian has any say in this matter is when the minor wants to get an abortion. And again, as we talked about in the second practice question in this video, in those cases, then the parent or legal guardian has to have their informed consent given for the minor to get an abortion. But when it comes to keeping the baby, the patient always gets to decide, and it doesn't matter what the parent or legal guardian wants. So that's the end of this video. Remember the, the different criteria for emancipation, E-M-A-N, emancipated. The earner, they have a job. The military, A, they live alone or they live independently. And N, they've exchanged their nuptials. And that is to say that they're married. Remember the three different practice questions that we did and the high yield findings that we you know, associated with these different conditions and ethical dilemmas. Good luck.